Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. In the collect today, we prayed asking God to grant that we may know and understand what things we ought to do, and also that we may have the grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. The Old Testament and the New Testament today tell the stories of men and women facing moral dilemmas and ethical choices. They were challenged to speak the truth to power, to stand firm in their call and convictions. They faced peer pressure and manipulations and ultimately made life or death decisions. Research says we make over 35,000 decisions daily. 35,000, 200 of them are about food. <laughs> but we also do everything from the routine to mundane questions such as what to eat or what to wear. And then we face major life decisions about our careers, our marriage, relationships, our children, health, faith, and ultimately God's call on our lives. This morning, for the time we have, I want to focus on making ethical choices and decisions by looking at our scriptures and two tools. Those tools are a moral center and a moral compass. Initially, I used these two terms interchangeably. I said Mother Teresa has a strong, had a strong moral center, while Dr. King exhibited a solid moral compass. However, as I reflected on the readings, I realized that a moral center and a moral compass are similar but different, and you need both. You need a moral center, and you need a moral compass. In the Old Testament, God used the plumb line to demonstrate to the people of Israel and to us the importance of a stable moral center in the story about Amos and Amaziah. At the same time in the New Testament, we see the conflict between John the Baptist and King Herod. Both stories demonstrate strong and weak moral centers and the moral compasses that stay on the path or veer off the path. Beginning with the story of Amaziah and Amos, we have a clash of convictions and directives. We have Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, he is known for his allegiance to the establishment and the status quo. Amaziah represents tradition and the prevailing religious order. He is steadfast in his beliefs and his duties. He's a man of influence and of power in his community, and he is respected for unwavering commitment to the king and the religious practices of the time. But then we meet Amos, an unexpected prophet. Amos was a shepherd out in the pasture with his sheep, and God called him. And God gave Amos a vision of the plumb line in his hand. And God said to him, what do you see? And Amos answered, a plumb line. However, if you're like me, you might have said, I see a string and a rock. This is a plumb line. It's a tool that carpenters use to build buildings and to make sure that they are straight and erect and that they don't lean to the left or the right. But God used the plumb line to symbolize justice for the line and the weight of righteousness for the weight. He used it to point to Amos, to the standard that he would judge Israel, and, and calls Amos to tell them clearly what is expected as right action and what is not. 
The message God has given Amos for the Israelites challenges the foundation of the society's norms at the time. But Amos does not faint or grow weary. His moral center is deeply rooted in his calling from God. Despite not being a professional prophet, he didn't come from a long line of prophets. He was a shepherd out in the pasture with his sheep. But his stability, his moral center, gave him the resilience to deliver God's message. He didn't alter that message. He didn't change it to gain favor or to avoid conflict. Amos's moral center was not swayed by external pressure, even pressure coming from Amaziah. He chose a stance of integrity, consistency, and obedience to God. Amaziah, on the other hand, the nemesis in this story, he's in the position where he's loyal to the king, even though it conflicts with his religious duties to uphold God's truth. His primary concern is maintaining his position and his favor with the king, rather than faithfully delivering God's message. He perceives Amos' prophecy as threatening the king's authority and stability. Amaziah should have prioritized his duty as priest to convey God's truth and lead people to righteousness. However, his actions show that his loyalty to the king and his own position takes precedence over his religious responsibilities. Amaziah demonstrates a wavering moral center and a failing moral compass. I always take note when God repeats a message for us, and he does this again in the New Testament with the conflict between John the Baptist, a man of God with good reputation, a strong moral center and a strong moral compass compared to King Herod of Galilee. He is a shrewd politician and a complex man, but he possesses a flawed moral center and a failing moral compass. These principles clash and their choices are put to the test. So we know how the story begins. Herod calls out John calls out Herod for marrying his brother's wife. Before you ask, it's not really clear what were the circumstances of this marriage. It could have been the result of an adulterous affair, or it could have been before or even after the divorce. The point is that John said it was wrong. He said it was unlawful. John spoke truth to power and demonstrated his moral center. But this truth put his life at risk and earned him the wrath of Herod's wife. Yet he did not flinch. How many of us can say the same? How often do we shy away from street speaking the truth to power because we fear the consequences? The consequences for John were severe. Herodias gets her revenge when she advises her daughter to ask for John's head on a platter when Herod says she can have anything she desires up to half of his kingdom. You can almost feel sorry for Herod as he was faced with two competing and compelling ideas. His respect for John the Baptist as a man of God. He listened to John. He was perplexed by what John said, but he thought highly of him. But then he had his desire to keep his oath, to save face in front of his people. He faced a moral conflict, but ultimately succumbed to the pressure leading to John's execution. Herod's action illustrated the danger of a weak moral conviction and the tragic consequences of listening to other people, of peer pressure, of failing to adhere to ethical principles. Herodias's manipulation of Herod through her daughter reveals how power and influence can be used for evil intent. So the lesson repeated in our readings today is this. 
that even the strongest moral center can be tested. And it's important to stay true to your principles, even in the face of adversity, even unto death, as in the case of John. I began the sermon by praying that we would ask what we ought to ask, and that we would be granted the power to act faithfully. But to this prayer, I must emphasize who we ask is also essential. Herod's daughter asked her mother, and we know how that ended. As a mother, I remember the first time my daughter called me from college in copious tears. I took a deep breath and stilled my heart, and I asked her a series of questions, and they went something like this. Are you dying? She said, no. Is someone you love dying? And she said, no. I said, are you hurt? Did you hurt someone? She said, no. And we came up with 10 questions along that vein that we affectionately called the top 10. The point is, I said to her that if it's not a top 10, then it's a dilemma and we can figure it out. After that, she would call and announce her dilemma and work it through as I listened. She had a strong moral center and was learning to navigate life with her moral compass. God implores us to ask him when we face moral challenges of our day and when we encounter dilemmas that threaten to compromise our integrity and send our moral compass off course. Ask him, ask him. If you look in the news today, everyone wanted to know about the news of the week, but we see many politicians facing conflicts similar to Amaziah, where their duty to serve the public good clashes with personal or party loyalties or personal gain. In business, Managers may prioritize personal profit over ethical practices or employee and customer well-being. Medical and healthcare professionals, they encounter conflicts daily between patient care, financial incentives, and insurance mandates. The list goes on. And I am certain that you can add your own ethical challenges to the list, but that takes inner reflection. It takes asking ourselves the hard questions. What is working in our lives and what is not pleasing to God? What are we holding on to that we can let go? It takes the strength and discipline displayed by Amos and John to stand firm, to make the hard choices, and embrace change. But here's the good news. God has given us two clear tools to assist us in meeting our ethical challenges and making good moral decisions. A plumb line and a moral compass or navigation map. The virtues and the values that our parents, our teachers, and priests have poured into us to create our character through the grace of God build our moral fiber. Our moral center is unchanging. It is the rock on which we stand. On the other hand, the moral compass, it's a navigation map. It provides guidance and direction and helps us find our way through various trials and tribulation. It offers us flexibility, and it changes as we grow and experience life. Our internal guide helps us discern right from wrong and make good ethical decisions. As our children grow, and as we age, we have so many opportunities to mature our moral center and nurture our moral compass so that it reflects our core values, God's values, and principles. 
So, how can we develop and enhance our moral stance? I'm so glad you asked. First, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to read the Bible daily and to pray daily. But once you do that, because that is the open line of communication to God. It starts there, it ends there. But by following this principle, you can identify what matters most to you and what you stand for. And you need to know what you stand for. You need to know the lines that you will not cross, that you won't allow anyone else to cross. We have to practice what we preach. We have to find people who exemplify strong moral character and learn from them. And finally, we engage with community groups that share and reinforce our values. In closing, I looked for a song that would encompass today's message. And I found a 100-year-old African-American folk song called Plumb the Line. And it was performed by Je Bessie Jones. And this morning, when I told Reverend Shana about this song, she challenged me to sing it instead of just share the lyrics. So with your prayers and patience, I'm going to close with this song, Plumb the Line, by Bessie Jones. Members, plumb the line. If you want to get to heaven, got to plumb the line. You got to live right, love right, preach right, do right, talk right, sing right, pray right, and get your heart right. If you want to get to heaven, you got to plumb the line.